Hi everybody, my name is Louis Strong and welcome to my second series of Headstrong. For any new listeners out there, Headstrong is a podcast that aims to highlight that vulnerability can be experienced by anyone and everyone and now is the time to talk about it. In engaging discussions with a variety of well-known individuals in the public eye, not only do they chat about their upbringings, their drives and their careers, but they also discuss their struggles. And so this podcast intends to help the listener become headstrong, to believe in themselves, to talk to others about their vulnerabilities and reinforce their self-worth. With the Rugby World Cup beginning on the 20th of September, I thought it was an absolutely prime opportunity to focus this second series on a Rugby World Cup special. I'm very fortunate to have met and chatted to a number of current and former players in both the world of domestic and international rugby. So I really hope you enjoy this second series, which, as I said, is solely focused on the sport of rugby. I'm also pleased to announce that this second series is in association with a great charity called Restart Rugby. They are the official charity of the Rugby Players Association, but more from Group CEO Damien Hopley at the end of the podcast. I wanted to kick off this second series with an absolute bang, and I'm extremely excited to have done just that. I sat down with one of the most inspiring men I've ever had the honour of chatting to. Ed Jackson had a successful career in domestic rugby when one accident diving into a shallow swimming pool changed his life forever. I really hope you enjoy this episode of Headstrong and please don't forget to rate, subscribe and tell all your friends and family and anyone who might be struggling. Ed Jackson, thank you so much for welcoming me into your house. You're very um, welcome, Andy Dog. Dog's yeah, I was going to say, welcome. this is the first one um, that Bramble's actually attended, so thanks so much for letting the little dog in as well. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So you turned 31 later this year, and it's probably fair to say that you've experienced so much in your life already by 30 slash 31, but I know that you've already got so many more endeavours that you're looking forward to and are planning on especially, but let's just go through your life, um, through these 30 years, from being a child to uh, a kid rugby star to your professional rugby player, and then your life after professional rugby. Does that sound good? Yeah, why not? I mean, hearing I'm 31 this year is a bit scary, but we yeah. could get used to that. Uh, well, My he, body feels like I'm 70, to be fair, so... <laughs> oh, God, I can only imagine. <laughs> so you were born in Bath, and then you were lucky enough to go to Millfield School which is a great school but can you recall what your first memory of rugby was or do you just remember it always being a part of you and your family and your life um to be honest it wasn't always a massive part of my family I mean we come from Bath which is a massive rugby town so you know we used to go down to the wreck and watch but actually I was um quite heavily into individual sports so I was a swimmer and a tennis player and um, they took up so much time that I didn't really have time to join, you know, p- play much rugby. Although I did join the minis when I was a lot younger. And then when I got to sort of eight or nine, started swimming more, swimming competitively, um, playing more tennis. And I lived out in the country with my parents. So I, I didn't really mix as much with other kids. It was kind of me and my brother and the whole team sport thing kind of, I found a little bit daunting when I was younger. Um I remember doing it as a kid and I was bigger than a lot of the other kids so that was quite a lot of fun although it was <laughs> it was it was just touch back then um but it wasn't until I went to Millfield that I really started sort of taking it seriously but I and it was only because I went there not playing rugby um and terrified about going into a boys boarding house having it just been me and my brother all of a sudden you're a 13 year old and all the 18 year olds are trying to hang you up on pegs by your pants you know um but um it sort of brought me out my shell quite a lot and I soon got tired of being in the swimming pool at five o'clock in the morning before school as a 12-year-old. And I just wanted to do what my mates were doing. And of course, that was rugby um, rugby and cricket. So I fell into team sports. And um, yeah, that was my first real memory was sort of third year at Millfield, uh, running around in the mud with my mates. So it's probably fair to say you started rugby quite late compared to others, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I, ha- I'm, I wouldn't say I'd never played rugby before no, then. Of but yeah, in terms of actually... It being one of my primary sports, yeah, it wasn't until I was at at senior school, yeah. And so once you were at senior school, you ended up captaining your school side, which was awesome. And then you actually played a lot of rugby uh, in uh, out of school. So you played England under 16s, England under 18s, and you actually captained one of the sides, didn't you? Yeah, I, I captained England under 18s um, 
a couple of times, um, which was quite weird because I was in I was in lower sixth when I played England under eighteens, and there was a few of the upper sixth in the England team. A bit of and chat. my captain from school, I was his captain at England, so we'd go back and play at school, and he was bossing me around. Then we'd go back to him, and I was bossing him around. But um, yeah, I, I suppose in that respect, I took to it quite quickly. Um, I played county regional at, at under sixteens and ended up playing for England. Obviously, Millfield was a massive part of that, um, given how good they are. At sport and the coaches, especially my house parent that I went into, a guy called John Brimacom, who's still there actually. His nickname's the Oracle. He's the the catalyst behind Millfield being so good at sevens. But he sort of brought me through and taught me everything I knew when I was a youngster. Um, and I didn't really look back from there. You know, when I got to 17, I found out that Bath were going to offer me a, a academy contract, full-time academy contract when I left school. So obviously all the... Uh, books got put down and the work went out the window and um, I was going to do PE for the rest of my life so happy days. With that sort of success at such a young age how much did that change your outlook as a young man because obviously that would have put education on the back foot straight away so how much was your outlook then purely rugby as the be all and end all and did that make you maybe I don't know did it change your characteristics as an individual and your outlook on life? It's tough to know if it changed my outlook on life but I certainly remember thinking oh well I've made it now. You know, as a six, seven, seventeen-year-old, I was like, "Well, I don't have to worry about doing any anything else." And and actually, back then, um, I think I was probably the last generation to come through into the professional ranks where we were actively advised not to go to university. You know, they were saying, "You know, you're fully committed. You've got to be fully committed to a rug- uh, to being a rugby player." You know, university would just be a distraction. Um, so as soon as I heard that, I was like, "Well, what's the point in doing A levels? You know, I'm not going to need to work again." You know, you, you kind of the blinkers go on. And you think that that's it for the rest of your life, obviously, naively, um, Mm. because now, you know, you you soon find out that if you're lucky enough to play till 30 or 28, as I did, that's a long career compared to most people. And you're still going to have to go on and do something else. But at the time, yeah, I thought it was a be all end all. I used to rock around school in my tracksuit and think I'd made it but um, well, your club ones your England ones whatever was whatever oh, no, was that going was, that, that was definitely uh, that was a bit of faux, a bit of a faux pas if you rock the club tracksuit your England tracksuit they'd come out around town though for sure yeah I can imagine <laughs> <laughs> I can so imagine that. And so, as you mentioned, you signed your first uh, contract with Bath, and then you had a pretty successful career spanning over 10 years, and you played for five big clubs. And do you hold one of those clubs close to your heart more than the others, or actually they all provided an opportunity in your career? Uh, That's a tricky question. I mean, they all played a vital part. They all played a part of my career, and actually I look back now, having played for five different clubs for one reason or another, and I see that as a benefit. At the time, you know, I was getting moved on because, you know, I went to play for Bath, which was my childhood club, dream come true. But then I ended up having three shoulder operations and sort of fell by the wayside. And at 21, I found, my, you know, the posh kid from from Bath, you know, from Millfield School was next thing you knew he was up in Doncaster, you know, on Silver Street, where not just the blokes could beat you up, but so could the women. So <laughs> it, was, it was a bit of a culture shock. But, you know, I, you know, how, how, how's your accent? Oh, I was trying to put it on, but I just kept my mouth shut. In fact, most of my family are from Sheffield, so I did okay. actually have little oasis oasis of um, support up there. But I mean, as soon it's the same as anywhere. You know, you're terrified about the thought of the change going up there, but actually, the reality is never as scary uh, as you think. And and very very quickly, I became best mates with all of those boys as you do every time you move club. Eventually, you're always terrified everyone's going to hate you, but you play rugby together, you put your sort of heart on the sleeve and your body on the line for each other and that bonds people pretty quickly. And I actually ended up playing more rugby in that year than I had done for the previous three at Bath. So I was 21-year-old playing in the Championship, which is still a very tough league, especially as a forward. And I developed more in that season than I had in the previous sort of three, four, five years um, before that. So it was a blessing It was a blessing in disguise. I think that was my first real taste of, you know, change isn't necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, for sure. And so you, your the fifth club that you ended up at, Newport Gwent Dragons, <laughs> a different place again. But that was the club you assigned to when your life pretty much turned around, right? Um, I know that you talk about it a lot, but if you don't mind painting a picture back back to that that day where you had your accident back in um, April twenty seventeen. Yeah, so I was playing at um, Dragons. I'd spent a couple of years at London Welsh and and then at Wasps and. Um, 
and my crazy coach Lynn Jones from when I was at Lynn, uh, at London what, what, uh, London Welsh invited me down to um, said look we've got something going on at the Dragons do you want to come down have a change of scenery change of and I got to sort of 26 or 27 aspirations of playing for England had gone um, I would, I signed for Wasps at the same time as a young youngster called Nathan Hughes. So with him and Haskell, etc., it meant I was having a lot of weekends off. Um, <laughs> so I just thought it'd be good to go and play a bit more rugby. And I was loving life down there. You know, Dragons, we didn't win a lot of games, but great bunch of boys, loved living in Cardiff, just loved the Welsh people in general, a lot more chilled out. Um, so I'd signed two more years and was really looking forward to it. And then I had a, re- had a reoccurring shoulder injury, um, I'd sort of gone eight years without without doing it since I'd had three before the age of 20. But um, I think now, just digressing a little bit, I think it's because of all the swimming I did when I was younger. I've sp- spoken to a few boys like Kin and Mile um, yeah. who were, were swimmers when they were younger and you get over mobile shoulders and then you go back in, you go into playing a contact sport. Yeah. The one thing you don't want mobile in contact sport is your shoulder joints, especially if you're tackling. Just any- touching on those shoulder injuries, yeah. how, how much did that put you back mentally in terms of when you were actually playing? Because obviously you see your mates day in, day out, going out there and training, but you're stuck in the physio room. How much did that play on your mind? That was really tough for me, like, because I got to 18 and, you know, I just sort of played for England a year young and, you know, I was coming through and it was not, not the next big thing. You know, it was never a sort of George Ford or Cipriani situation. But, you know, there was high aspirations, not not just f- internally from myself, but from other people. Ironically, high aspirations on your shoulders. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> via high aspirations on my shoulders as well. So bang, that first shoulder injury, you know, gave me a knockback. But then it, I did it again after nine months of rehab, the first game back. So bang, straight back into nine months of rehab. And as an 18, 19 year old, all of a sudden the clubs start losing interest. People stop talking about you. And it, it was tough mentally. And I had to dig in and get through that. And, you know, you spend a lot of lonely hours in, in, in the physio room and in the gym and you start to learn how to motivate yourself rather than just riding the wave of other people motivating you. And I know what we're going to get onto, but I think those experiences early on and, and the fact I have spent a lot of time in rehab meant that it helped me, you know, in, in, in the last couple of years, for sure. Mm, I, mean, I think especially at such a young age, when you're put through that that kind of challenge, you, ha- you actually have to learn on your feet. Whilst you do have that support network at such a young age, you do need to still push yourself um, to kind of get through that situation. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tricky one because... Um, it's easy to be dragged along with the, you know, with, with the crowd and, you know, when people are pumping you up every week and, but all of a sudden you realize how fickle sport is, you know, it is a business at the end of the day. Mm. And if, if you're not on the pitch or you're going through a period of time where your body's broken down, then they'll quite quickly, you'll quite quickly start to get forgotten about unless you've already built up a huge reputation. And obviously as an 18, 19 year old, you haven't got that. You know, I still hadn't really, I played one, senior men's game of rugby by that point so I had nothing to fall back on so then other people start losing interest in you but you've got to try and keep interested yourself and I I nearly gave up rugby at 20 21 um going to Doncaster was a really tough decision for me and actually my dad persuaded me you know give it one more go because because I was still quite young at 20 I could have the easy option would have been me to go to uni Mm. and because I come out of a professional system like it would have helped me getting into a decent uni Mm. um and you know that would have been a good good path for me but I thought give it one more go and and Donny was a bit of a turnaround in my in my career in that respect but yeah you you do have to when your back's against the wall and you quite quickly realize that actually you've only got yourself to um you, you it's only you who's looking after you at the end of the day exactly you have to um you have to front up and 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 try and get on with things so let's fast forward. Uh, sorry for the detour of the slight podcast, right. of the podcast. Um, so yes, you were enjoying some weekends off uh, back in April, or back at uh, Newport, uh, and in April 2017, you had your accident. Yeah. So I come back to Bath for the weekend. Um, I was sort of three months or a couple of months into a shoulder after shoulder surgery, and I was fine with that. You know, I, I was basically had the rest of the year off. They'd extended my rehabs t- to incorporate the off season because there was no point trying to rush back for one or two games at the end of the year when I could have an extra few months to play it safe. Um, and we came back home, went round to um, I was to see my parents, went round to some family friends' house. Really nice day to use their swimming pool. They had like a feature pool, waterfall in one end. I just took my shirt off, dive, turned around and dived in where the waterfall hit the water. 
and where the water where the waterfall hit the water obviously all the water was disturbed you couldn't see the bottom of the pool and I don't know I was just thinking waterfall deep water the way the rock face was and and dived in and and I thought what I thought was about six feet deep only turned out to be about three feet deep um smacked my head on the bottom of the pool um and first reaction was oh that hurt oh you know I've hit my head pretty hard there but I didn't lose consciousness or anything um, went to stand up to check if I had any blood and that's when I sort of realised that something was wrong. I had a bit of movement in my right side, enough to sort of push off the bottom, rolled over, got my head above the water, just shouted help and then fell back into the water and couldn't move really. And then, uh, you know, the next the next uh, instance or, or the next feeling I had was just pure panic because I thought I was going to drown and that's quite a primal fear you know if anyone's dunked your head underwater as a kid that feeling of you know panic is is quite um it's quite an intense one and that's I can remember it really vividly I think because of that but I was lucky that my dad and my mate were there and people were in the pool they realized what the angle I'd gone in at um came and pulled me to the surface and my dad being a doctor um knew to hold me still because something wrong was wrong with my head or neck so uh that was it I was you know I I'd I had a little bit of movement still on my right side, but that quickly drifted away. And, and the next thing you know, I couldn't really move or, or feel anything from below my neck. So at what point did the severity of what actually occurred sink in? Because I, I've heard you talk previously that the your trip to hospital actually took far longer than you actually anticipated. Was the severity of what happened, um, did it sink in, you know, when you, when you were lying there in the swimming pool, obviously you had that immediate reaction of my, maybe I might drown. I don't know. I don't know what's going on with my injury right now, but I might drown. Or was it when you were in the in the ambulance or was it when you woke up in the uh, intensive care unit? At what point did you realise that shit, you know, my life has changed? I didn't realise my life had changed until a few months down, you know, six weeks down the line because you don't know how much recovery you're going to make. I knew I had a serious injury. But at the time, I think I was... I think I was still in shock because um, I was still cracking jokes at my mate for looking so scared. I said, why have you gone white? You're fine, sort of thing. And and, um, and I think that was shock. Maybe it's the body's mechanism of defending itself, you know, not getting too emotional about the situation, trying to make right decisions. I knew it was serious, but I'd had serious, in my head, serious injuries before, you know, knee operations, shoulder operations, and all I'd done is go to hospital, they'd done an operation, and then I'd spent a few months doing rehab and I was back better again. And I think that's what I just clicked into. It's like, right, fine, get me to hospital, I'll be all right. Um, I think the first time I realised that it was maybe a bit more serious than that was just the look on my dad's face. He is like your trademark stoic Yorkshireman, no nonsense, never had an ounce of sympathy off him in my life. And he's a doctor and he's seen it all before. You know, you spend 30 years as a GP and, you know, he's been in operating theatres when people have died. And, you know, he was unflappable, basically. Um, but I And he was saying the right things, but I could see the look of panic not panic but like he was like shit I could tell it in his face and that that sort of shook me a little bit I think um at the time I thought okay why is he being like that he's talking really calmly but I have never seen that look on him before but anyway I quickly forgot about that and um went went to went to hospital um they scanned me and obviously I'd done I'd quite badly broken my neck I dislocated um my c6 and c7 and the disc in between didn't explode and there were shards of bone in my spinal cord. So they rushed me straight, straight into the operating theatre. And you said then about it taking a bit longer than I thought. I mean, they didn't tell me till an hour, an hour, a year after my dad didn't sort of pluck up the courage to tell me that actually what I thought was, um, what I thought was 15 minutes in the ambulance was actually two and a half hours. They were waiting at the hospital for me to arrive because they had to pull over three times to resuscitate me. So that puts a bit of a different spin on things. There was uh, there was no pearly gates, you know. It was just me feeling a bit tired, and I can remember them trying to keep me awake. I remember in the ambulance, you know, I was just thinking, "Oh, let me just have a nap." You know, we're driving to the hospital. I know it's only twenty minutes away, but there was obviously something a bit more serious going on, and they were having to give me shots of adrenaline um, to effectively keep me alive, which is um, a bit difficult to get your head around. I mean, I suppose it makes you realise how easy. You know, something could slip away like that, but it puts um, it makes it makes me feel even more lucky about what's happened since because I thought the low point, 
the bottom point was when I woke up in intensive care those first few days. But clearly the low point was in the ambulance when I literally scraped the bottom, if you know what I mean, yes, before sure. heading back up. In your second ever blog post, you said that so far I have found the main battle to fight is mental rather than physical. Naturally, what you went through is was incredibly physically disabling. But how fragile were you in those first couple of weeks mentally? And what, how did that make you feel with that change from not being able to move parts of your body and being stuck in this hospital room and unable to be independent at that time? Where was that putting you mentally? Uh, yeah, I mean, when I, I woke up in intensive care, my first reaction was, um, oh, what have I done, you idiot? Like, if you dislocate your shoulder again, you know, I've woken up in, I've not, I've never woken up in intensive care before, but I've woken up in hospital quite a few times after anaesthetic. I'd had seven operations as a player and I completely forgot why I was in there. But then it slowly dawned on me what happened and it took me about five minutes to pluck up the courage to even try and move anything because I was just like, if I can't move, I thought they must have fixed me. I'll be all right. But if I can't move anything, then that nightmare has kind of become a reality. And I tried moving my left foot and my right foot and I couldn't move anything apart from shrug my right shoulder a little bit. And from that moment on, I just sort of nose dived. Um, uh, I was putting on a brave face for my family and my friends. And I was very lucky to have a lot of support. I've got an amazing group of friends and go back to why it's beneficial to play for five clubs rather than one your whole life. Because I was, you know, I was good enough to play professionally, but not good enough to lock down one, one club for my whole career. But that meant I have five times as many mates, I think, because of it. And so I always had a room full of, um, full of mates and, and, and family and friends. So you, they're a distraction during the day and you're putting on a brave face. But the reality of the situation is you've gone from being a professional athlete and putting your pride in, in your body and being known for being that big guy walking down the street, which you come to realise is a load of bollocks. And I have come to realise that. But at the time, it feels like your whole identity has been taken away because I literally can't move. And I'm shrinking away in front of my eyes. I can't wash myself. I can't breathe for myself properly. I can't cough. So they have to come in and keep putting suction tubes down my throat. I can't go to the toilet for myself. And it's very degrading, especially for, it's a degrading for anyone, but for a young, proud, you know, 20 something bloke, having someone clean you and go to the toilet, help you go to the toilet and things like that was tough to deal with mentally, but I wasn't letting that on to my parents. But then obviously they would leave at eight o'clock every night. And that's when it would all hit me and I couldn't sleep because every time I dozed off to sleep, I'd start choking or the alarms would go off because my heart rate, one, I had this ridiculous thing in intensive care because my heart rate was at sitting about 43, 45 beats per minute. As soon as I slept, fell asleep, it would dip below 40 and then all the alarms would go off and there was no override on the machine to do that. So, to, so it just became like sleep torture and those first five or six days, I'd be lying if I didn't have some dark thoughts that I'd never want to think again. But I was never letting any of that on to my parents. And you probably won't find much about that in my blogs. You know, I've said I've struggled mentally, but I'd never go into any detail because I knew that I, well, I wrote those whilst I was still going through things. Obviously, I wasn't writing at that time because I couldn't move. But a couple of weeks down the line when I was recording things on Alexa, I was very conscious that my wife and my mum was... Um, was reading what I was writing about my emotions. So I was almost protecting them at the same time. So I was as honest as I can, but I think the depths of my emotional sort of trauma haven't, you know, weren't, weren't really highlighted. I've spoken to them about it since. And I think actually you'll understand and a lot of people understand it's sometimes it's not until you face the, those sort of darker moments that you start to appreciate the lighter ones, but there certainly were in those first, so that first sort of, week two weeks before I moved anything um some some pretty tough times yeah yeah you mentioned there that your your family and your friends from the variety of clubs that you played for were you know your support network and helped keep that positive mental frame of mind during the day and obviously you, th those those thoughts when you're on your own will naturally slip into your mind but was there anything else, any exercises perhaps or that um, kept you going day to day or anyone in particular that might have inspired you that actually you thought, oh, maybe that, that might have, uh, that kept you positive as well, not just your friends and family? There were so many things sort of playing into it. I remember in those early stages, um, well, I mean, I can still remember the turning point, which was when the the, the surgeon came in on his morning ward round and um, had had a different person with him who I didn't recognise and it turned out to be the hospital psychologist. And I thought, oh God, here we go. What's going on here? 
Um, and they basically thought that I hadn't come, that I hadn't accepted what had happened because I was putting this break. I was just smiling and laughing during the day, playing jokes with people, friends with the nurses. But then at night, obviously, the night nurses knew what was going on, and I think they wanted to bring the serious, the severity of the situation to light. And they said to me, um, you know, they said we've done your America, the, the, your Asia test, which is the American Spinal Injury Assessment. And you're coming up as category Asia A, you know, they test you, it takes about an hour every day, pinpricks, sensation, movement. Um, so I was showing as a complete spinal cord injury. So they said, because of the level of your injury, the likelihood is you'll never walk again. We're hoping you'll get the use of your arms back to a certain degree so that you can use a wheelchair. So from that moment on, I think I remember looking at my mum and my wife and um, they had, we'd been thinking it, but no one had really said it before. And all of a sudden, someone had sort of made it a reality. And I remember looking at their faces and just thinking, oh, that can't be the case. I have, I have to get my arms moving so that I can be independent because I can't put this burden on them for the rest of their life. And that's all my aim was in the first couple of weeks or for the first month, two months, was just to become independent so I could wash myself, dress myself, clean myself, live by myself. Um, and I had some very tough conversations with the wife over the coming weeks and stuff about, you know, if it doesn't get to that stage, then we, you know, I don't want to put you through this. And there was a lot of sort of emotional, emotional moments like that. But if someone had offered me a wheelchair for the rest of my life in the first month, I would have bitten their hand off as long as I was independent. Obviously, I'm glad they didn't <laughs> because I'm a little bit more than independent now. Um, but your goalposts, your goalposts move, you know. And in those totally. early, in those early days, it was that doctor saying that to me, basically laying down the gauntlet. I think being a competitive person that was part of part of the reason, but it was also making it a reality, making me realise how serious this was, even though I kind of already knew made me bounce back and f start fighting and that's when I really spent every waking hour trying to move something even though I couldn't did you set yourself little goals each day or until well, you goal, achieved my, it my goal at that stage was just to move anything anything but, yeah you were so just happy you close my eyes and just try and wiggle something so I had a long term goal of being independent yes daily I was like if I can get some movement and then one day day five my finger twitched mm. which was amazing first thing that had moved that hadn't been moving but that was a but my c6 c7 so they were expected me to get some movement back in my fingers sure but after 10 days my toe flicked a week 10 days i can't remember now but yeah a few days later my toe flicked and that's what they said would never happen so all of a sudden it was like right we're on here yeah there's the hope i needed uh, did that change your yeah. your frame yeah. of mind I was like, well, after five days of trying to wiggle stuff and nothing ever, nothing happening, obviously doubt creeps in. You know, you try and stay as positive as you can. And that's why I said the mental, the battle was a mental one, not a physical one. Completely. Because I couldn't move. So it wasn't a physical battle. The mental battle of staying positive and keep doing, keep doing the work and just keeping the faith because could have quite easily laid there and, and given up and pretended nothing that, that it wasn't going on, which a lot of people do, and rightfully so. It's a scary time. But I think the motivation, the external motivation of getting better for my family was strong enough for me to keep digging in. The motivation for me to get better for myself wasn't enough. I was just feeling sorry for myself. I mean, after a month of being in the hospital, despite the obvious changes to your body, and I just think something that, you really held on to was your own personality and I've, I've reread the blogs a couple of times now just to prepare for this and and it's amazing how funny they are and I think that that was that really something that you tried to hold on to and just not only stay positive but actually your your sense of humor and personality really come through in the blogs was that something really important to you my favorite one was when you were talking about Deliveroo and like all the food coming into the ward around Easter and you weren't able to get it and you're all the props there it's like, oh. yeah yeah surrounded by yeah. yeah there's a high concentration of props around easter as the coffers started filling up with chocolate because mm. people would turn up in the room and obviously bring you loads of food as a you know oh it's, you it's know, a gift it's a gift yeah there was a huge turnover of food going on in my wardroom but none of it was to do with me si mcintyre and will <laughs> taylor two of the wasp props basically moved in um <laughs> beds either side yeah um I didn't mind though because it meant people were coming back and you know there was something else to offer but I can remember there's some funny moments like my mates feeding me burritos one of my mates Suto Tom Suto mate from school he's like we call him Gammy Suits because he's just a bit like I don't know he's just a bit all over the shop and I remember him feeding me a burrito <laughs> meaning the best thing in the world but he's basically shoving it all over my face I can't move I'm just like this <laughs> And then he's taking, he's giving me one bite and then taking one bite himself. And I'm like, no, keep it away. And then shoving another bite in my mouth. 
But moments like that are like what you look back and, and laugh about. And you need you need some more normality, especially when you're spending months in the hospital. And I, I wrote another blog, like Laugh Through the Crap, which was re- more recent yeah. um, when I ended up uh, having an accident in the car on the way down to Cardiff. And, you know, my reaction before would have been like, Devast- oh, this is so nice, so embarrassing, devastating. And you just end up laughing because you've gone through this situation where you realise that your sense of humour and your mental state is everything. That's something people can't take away from you. They can take away you know, your body and your movement, but you can't take away someone's mind unless, you know, by something happening to them, you are in control of that to a certain extent. And I know it's difficult and it kind of felt like someone was trying to fuck with me mentally as well but I found that by trying to keep some normality that's the advantage of having rugby mates you know yeah yeah you know, um, so McIntyre came in one of the wasp props he came in and um, in intensive care knew fully well I couldn't move and chucked three juggling balls on my chest and said well you're in here for a while so you might as well learn a new skill <laughs> you know and most people sort of they pussyfoot around a little bit because they want to they don't want to say anything that will insult someone and it's tough to know how someone will react so I understand that but just to be treated normally and to make light of a very serious situation is kind of a breath of fresh air because otherwise you're just making it more serious or as serious. It's already a, already a serious situation. So what's the point in, in highlighting it? You've now done, I believe, over 139 blog posts. Um, how important has that blog been, not only on the road to your recovery, but knowing that you have ha- managed to help others and inspire others to push through in their own challenges? I mean, yeah, it's... Is it quite overwhelming when you actually com- think about it? It's completely overwhelming. I mean, this morning I was speaking to a girl called Sophie's dad, giving them her, the, you know, she's broke her neck uh, last week. Uh, sorry, last year. Um, and, you know, just giving them advice. And, you know, it all started, I was keeping voice notes on, on my phone on, on through Alexa Obviously, Alexa becomes your best friend when you can't move. And she's not in here, funnily enough. Not no, at home. no, Alexa is no longer, no. I, after my wife thought we were, we were having an affair, <laughs> just because she, Alexa won't speak to Lois, she'll only speak to me. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and and I woke up one day, and one of the boys was uh, obviously reading up, reading all through my voice notes, as the, as they do. And I was like, oh, that's private. And... Uh, he said, mate, you, you should make some of this public because it, it might help someone one day. And I just thought if it can help one person, then it's worthwhile. And I was never really one of those people to put myself out there. You know, I was a stereotypical male rugby player, you know, or, you know, any any young bloke. You know, you don't want to show weakness or emotion. And, and I probably posted twice on Instagram before before that point. Um, so I said, OK, you know, it's just a daily diary. I didn't actually look what was hap- like if I was getting any responses. Um, and then my wife thought, you know, she said, uh, have you seen what's going on? I was like, no. And then after like a week, you know, there was like 10,000 people following it and all these people commenting and replying. And I was like, oh my God, shit. I was like, I'm actually going to have to keep this up now. <laughs> but but, but the, ma- the main thing for me was I-, I started it to try and help other people maybe. And actually, it ended up helping me more than anyone. Because I was going to say, absolutely. I was not only being able to offload what was going on in my head, you know, when people left, it gave me something to do when they all got kicked out of the ward. But also, um, it automat- it all of a sudden opened up this whole world of, of contacts of people who had been through something similar before in their life. And all of a sudden, you're speaking to people who you can who can relate to your situation, but you can relate to theirs. And they can offer you advice that might not be any different to what you're getting from your friends and your family but because they've been through it before it really sinks in and also you can talk to them about things that you don't want to speak to your family about and I mentioned before about not being not honest but not being too in depth about my emotions in the early days because I didn't want to upset my family but all of a sudden I had people who I could be completely honest with and say look I've had a fucking shit day I just want to bury my head under the pillow. And they're like, don't worry, I, I felt like that. That's completely normal, dig in. You know, and now, and and there were other people, so that really helped. But there were other people contacting me saying, oh my God, this is helping me so much. You know, it's putting my own problems in context. And it wasn't just people who, have been, who were going through spinal cord injuries, but it was people with, you know, depression and things like that. And they would say, we love reading it and seeing how you're being positive, you know, d- despite what's going on. So then I got this, overwhelming sense of value and I'd felt so useless for so long everyone's having to do everything for me 
that it was quite depressing. Um, and then all of a sudden I felt like, oh my God, I can actually help people. There might actually be some good that can come out of this situation. And that was really um, addictive. Like uh, I was like, Great. you know, helping other people or feel like feeling like it was benefiting other people was really helping me emotionally. So I just wanted to carry on doing it. So that's when I started writing every day, speaking to people personally. And that hasn't really stopped. I don't write as regularly now about the blogs because it's not as interesting what's going on in my day as when I was in was when I was in hospital but I still do a lot of writing a lot of it I keep to myself and potentially will release bits bits and bobs every now and again um but I always talk to people I spend a lot of my day speaking to people because now I'm two and a half years down the line there's people who I get contacted saying I've just broken my neck or their family will contact me saying I've just broken my back, not necessarily just spinal cord injuries, but mostly because that's where it's most relevant. And when you start a conversation with, I don't know what to do, um, my life's over, I just, I can't believe I've done this, um, I want to kill myself. And 20 minutes later, they're saying, oh, thank you so much, I'm really going to give it a good go. And you become, I've become friends with loads of these people and that one 20 minute conversation means more than anything that I've done in my life before that, you know, anything I've achieved in rugby or, um, and I feel that that's a real gift. Um, and I feel really lucky to be in that situation that I can affect other people like that. And it's something that I will never take for granted and I'll never stop doing and I'll never be willing to sacrifice time away from doing that. Um, because I love it and because other people did it for me and I know how much it can affect, it, it can make a difference. Just jumping back slightly, um, just going back on the blog, on, on day 43, this was the first time that you were allowed to leave the hospital. And I can only imagine the whirlwind of emotions that you were experiencing from apprehension to fear to excitement. But what was going through your head on that day where you were like, I am now allowed out of this hospital? Was it a new chapter or did you just think I am motivated and this is the next step in my recovery? Um I definitely wasn't apprehensive. I was fucking desperate to get, to yeah, get out, yeah, sure. you know. <laughs> yeah. But um, it was, it was uh, yeah, it was a great day. I mean, we'd, we'd uh, my friends used to come in and sneak me out to the pub whilst I was in hospital. So I, it wasn't the first time actually away. <laughs> Sorry, from the, NHS. <laughs> yeah, from the hospital. Um, yeah, there was some funny times, you know, when I had, yeah. I mean, you spend three months in, hosp in, in a spinal unit you find ways to entertain yourself and all the other people are doing the same thing. And uh, I'd heard that, but just before I got in there, there was a high concentration of younger people who had actually ordered a, disa a disabled taxis and gone out and gone clubbing in ta in Salisbury, <laughs> a group of like eight of them. And they came for the morning ward round and wondered why none of them, all of them refused to get out of bed and they all stank of booze. But, um, you know, it's normal people at the end of the day. Like they're just, you know, and that's the thing people forget. I went into the spinal unit thinking I was going to be surrounded by stuntmen and acrobats. And actually it was just a complete cross check, cross section of, of society, you know, not, you know, mums, dads, brothers, sisters, every race, religion, age, men, women, and that, that kind of, I was digressing a little bit, but I think it's quite an important point. I think that was the first time I realized when I went into the spinal unit from being on a ward, just by a room by myself, that, my attitude towards my injury changed. I felt, um, I started to feel lucky about my situation because although I didn't have as much movement as some people in there, um, I was a lot better off than others. And you said what helped me actually early on, Matt Hampson and Henry Fraser were two sort of key points for me because mm. they were the only people I knew with spinal cord injuries because they were rugby. Exactly, yeah. Um, and I, when I woke up, Matt especially I knew that I was I was bad but I wasn't as bad as him you know he's got a tracky and in so he can't breathe for himself but I'd met Matt and I knew how positive he was and I saw the amazing things he was doing and you know it helped me put my situation in context and actually think well shit if he's if he's getting on with it then what excuse have I got I mean it doesn't make it a lot easier but it really does really does help and that happened again when I went to the spinal unit I was improving other people weren't I might have still been really bad and not knowing if I was going to walk again, but at least I was in a situation where I had a chance. So I think that that hope and that is just just reframing. On paper, I was still really, you know, I was still really badly off and I was still in a bad situation, but I was just looking at it a different way. My perspective on my situation had changed and all of a sudden I started to see my situation as a positive thing. I started to realise how lucky I was that my dad was in the pool, that 
I was so close to a leading spinal unit that um, that I had an amazing support network, that I had a strong net from being a rugby player. All of these things, I started to focus on the positives rather than how unlucky I was to dive into the wrong end or, you know, and start to feel negative about it. And then as soon as I reframed it as a positive situation, my body started kicking in and my my mind I felt was leading my physical recovery and it just started to accelerate and it was only about eight weeks later and I was on my feet you know still using a wheelchair but I'd stood up started taking my first steps backwards but I was in a good place I used to say turn to my dad sometimes and say is it really wrong that I'm actually enjoying this because yeah, there's sure. some days where you get a little win and that little win, you know, I'm so used to physical challenges my whole life. Because you're a competitive, you've got a competitive mind. So yeah. if you overcome a challenge and succeed at something, you're like, well. Yeah. I've and also it. that success, you know, just moving in something a little bit more affects the rest of your life. It's not just going to get you a medal. It's going to be the difference between you actually being able to walk or not. You know, so, um, yeah, there was good days and there was bad days, but it's not. I think that that was a big turning point, like the doctor telling me I was never going to be able to walk again. The next big turning point was actually reframing my situation and seeing the positives in it rather than the negatives. Speaking of those challenges, within a year, you said that you were going to climb Snowdon, which is an incredible feat for a normal person or, you know, somebody who's not necessarily physically, you know, ready to go and do it. But you you were still within a year of your recovery from the injury. I just want to know... Um, what parts of your motivation were to do it for yourself? How much of it was to inspire others and how much was it to prove to the doctors and all the people that said you weren't going to walk? How much of those three things, which which was most balanced, like weighted? Well, you've done your research because those are the three things, I think. But which one one did you kind of say? uh, I think, I mean, weighted-wise is different to the the initial thought was, right, I'm going to prove everyone wrong. Um... But actually, it wasn't that. It wasn't like in a nasty way because the doctors didn't hope that I wouldn't walk again. It was just the way that the structure's set up and they don't want to open themselves up to litigation. But for me, I took it as a competitive thing. But I also wanted to pay back all the charities that had helped me up to that point, named mostly Restart Rugby. Um, That was a big driving force for me. But the main thing, the primary focus, not wasn't the initial one, but actually... What I realised and why I had to, I said I had to do it on the 12 month mark um, was I wanted to um, set an example for all the other people in hospital who'd been given a negative prognosis or a guarded prognosis that maybe that wasn't necessarily going to be the case, that you can defy the odds, at least give it the best go. And I say that carefully because obviously some people don't have the opportunity for improvement. But I can guarantee there's a lot of people rolling around in wheelchairs out there that if they had been given the right motivation and support like I had, because I was lucky to have these people, I have this support network, a lot of people didn't have a support network, they wouldn't be in that situation. And, you know, that it always takes me back to a guy called NASA, who was one of the first people I met on the spinal unit. Um, and he'd been in there for six months and he was giving me the lowdown of life on the unit, you know, and he was like, you know, they'll get you in here and you, they'll tre- teach you how to wheelchair and the, use a wheelchair and they'll get you out. He was like, I'm just waiting for my care home or house to move back in for a house to move back into, but I'm completely fucked. There's no way I can make an improvement. They've told me that. So there's no point doing physio or anything. Had a super pubic catheter, the lot. I'm sat there watching MTV with him. All of a sudden I see him tapping his foot. I'm like, Nas, what are you doing? You can actually move your foot. He's like, yeah. I was like, what else can you do? And he's like, started to lift his leg off the, off the uh, wheelchair a little bit. And my first thought was like, well, shit, I can't accept that that means he's in a wheelchair for the rest of his life because he's already got more movement than me. So I was like, right, Nas, you're coming to the gym with me tomorrow. So we just started taking him with us, me and my other mate, Rick, um, and going down there and trying to motivate him and make him realise that actually there was a chance to get more improvement. We didn't know if there actually was or not, but he had been told there definitely wasn't. They were trying to get him out the door. A year later, he emailed me and he said that he's walking again with a stick. And all it was was a change in his mindset, deciding that, going from deciding that he was in a wheelchair in the rest of his life to actually maybe I can walk again. That's all it took. And then everything else followed. So by climbing Snowden on the 12-month mark and having a little bit of publicity behind it because of being a rugby player, I hoped to spread the message that despite what they tell you, there might still be a chance. And hopefully people would just give that, hold on to that hope a little bit more. And if it only meant 15 or 20% of people ended up back on their feet, then that was enough enough for for me. It's enough for me. Mm. 
Hi everybody, sorry to interrupt the podcast, just a quick word from our two sponsors. Headstrong is very fortunate to have found two amazing sponsors and supporters for Season 2 of Headstrong, the Rugby World Cup Special, forming a brilliant partnership between Headstrong, our chosen charity Restart Rugby, and themselves. They cover between them all aspects of global insurance and both have strong historical ties to the wider rugby and well-being communities. Ascot Group is a Bermuda domiciled global specialist in insurance and reinsurance. Built on a foundation of underwriting expertise, but with a culture of collaboration, dedication, empowerment and accountability that is the fabric of the company. Their integrity is reinforced by a strong track record and dedication to clients, brokers and partners. For more information on Ascot Group, visit www.ascotgroup.com. BMS are an entrepreneurial, agile, specialist insurance and reinsurance broker that prides itself on their reputation for exceptional client service and position as one of the leading global brokers. For more information on BMS, visit www.bmsgroup.com. Now, back to the podcast. So you you briefly mentioned Restart Rugby earlier, uh, and on just that Snowden adventure, let's call it, you raised over twenty two grand for the for the charity, um, and you also had over seventy people turn up to help you on that walk. But where did Restart Rugby fit into all of that recovery at first? Where did you first learn about them, and how did they start becoming you know part of your life? I mean, I knew about Restart before because, you know, obviously being an RPA member from playing the Premiership, but to actually, you never, you know that they do a lot of good work, but you don't really, it's not until you experience it firsthand that you realise how important they are. And for me, the first two weeks, um, I think, understandably, everyone was being very respectful because you hear that, you know, I've broken my neck, people, I'm in intensive care, people don't know, the, so they keep their distance because respect to the family. But then after two weeks, they were the first people to come to me and, and basically say they came in. A guy called Rich Bryant, who's um, one of the directors there, came in and said, look, Ed, we just want you to know that, you know, when you leave hospital, we're, we're there to support you financially in terms of we will we will make sure you get the best possible care in terms of rehab after you leave hospital. You can't bring external private um, physios into, into the NHS. Yeah. Um, so... And in that respect, I mean, the NHS is amazing. I mean, it has its pitfalls, but the individuals involved were incredible. I still work with them. What two of the physios that I work with within the NHS are coming to climb a mountain in Nepal with me next next month? So it shows the bonds that you you create with people over, over time. Um, but since I left, Restart had fund have funded my my physio. I mean, it's a lot less intensive now and that because I can do a lot of it myself and the the other advantage of being a rugby player is you get access to you know I've been working closely with Kerry Parnham who's one of the bath physios who I work with at Wasps and um you know and there's a there's a Hobbs Hobbs rehabilitation which is a neuro specialist rehab unit down in Shepton Mallet near here and the care I've had since I've left has been unbelievable but I wouldn't have been able to afford to do it myself so by coming in and saying that to me after two weeks had such a massive effect because even though they weren't actually doing anything by that point, it meant that I didn't have to worry anymore about the future. I could concentrate a hundred percent on trying to get as, be- as well as I could. Um, instead of having to worry, shit, am I going to have to sell my house? You know, neurophysio is expensive. Mm. So what situation does my wife have to be in with work? And, you know, all of these, all of these thoughts and all that cloudiness that is getting in the way of you just getting down and focusing got alleviated by them coming in and offering support. And I've done so much with them since and because I realised how important they are, especially in the mental health space, which is obviously another area that I'm quite interested in and people transitioning out of the game. Um, I've had a lot of friends gone through it. I've gone through it. Um, that I'm now on the board of trustees for Restart, you know. So um, they've been amazing. They've helped me a huge amount. I'm actually going to climb a mountain, and it, you know, um, the Alpine Challenge for Restart Rugby in two weeks time um and i continue to work closely with them because it's hard for people to realize how important the work they do is because most of it is around the mental health space so it's confidential so trying to ask for money or support for professional rugby players is a bit tricky you know if it's spinal cord injuries or 
cancer, you know, everyone knows some, someone who's affected by that. And it's more obvious that, that the help's needed for that. But if you're asking people to sponsor or, you know, support professional rugby players, they're like, why? You know, they're professional sports people. They don't need any help. But what people don't realise is the issues are surrounding especially mental health when it comes to professional sport and, of course, finishing having to retire from professional sport. That's an interesting point because uh, so, obviously the, a lot a lot of mental health issues may come from retirement, but there's uh, times in uh, a rugby player's career where perhaps the press get too involved and you know get attack a player for for some whatever reason that might might have happened. Do you restart work with the press at all? Um, because obviously this invasion of privacy and um, kind of making someone feel like an enemy is not not good for someone's mental health, and sometimes I don't think the press realise that. So do, do restart help in any way there? Restart there. The RPA do restart are there to as support reactive rather than proactive. RPA are there being proactive and helping towards that. The media is interesting one because obviously, I mean, I work on the media side yeah, now with no. Channel Four. Yeah, for and sure. I know as a player, there's a responsibility, and it doesn't mean. And players know that they can't just do what they want and get, and everyone's just going to sing their praises and get away with it. But there's definitely a responsibility by the media to realise that these are just human beings at the end of the day and there's certain ways to go around things. But it's not just that. I mean, even if the media were being nice, it's the public which is the problem. You know, on social media, players are getting attacked for having a bad game as if they meant to do it. You know, and, and yeah, it's fine for some boys because they're thick-skinned and they can they can get away with it, but... The one thing I, I, I've been saying and I always say is like just because you're a professional sports person doesn't mean you're a certain way mentally because a lot of these guys and girls who end up in professional sport, they just happen to be born a little bit more coordinated or a little bit more physically talented than the next kid. And it's the one profession where you get guided into it and you're almost told the whole way that you're so lucky to be doing it, you can't possibly do anything else. In fact, if you go and choose to do something else... It's an insult to everyone else who doesn't have the ability to do what you're doing. So that means that you might have, I'm just going to throw random names at that. You might have like Joe Launchbury, who actually wants to be an impressionist artist, you know, but he's a professional rugby player because he's been told you're a big kid. You're, you're really lucky to be doing this. I mean, I know that Joe actually loves rugby, but this is just an <laughs> example. And a lot of players are in professional sport. And I know in rugby, I can talk about rugby. A lot of the boys hate their jobs. Because they've ended up doing something that they weren't really mentally born to do, if you like, but they've been told their whole life since they were a young kid that that's what they should do. And they can't possibly give it up because that would be an insult to everyone else who didn't have the ability to do that. So there's guys sat there thinking, hang on a minute, I'm getting injured every week, my body's on the line, I'm not getting paid relatively much money compared to a lot of other sports, I'm getting insulted personally every week on social media or by the press, and I don't even want to be doing this in the first place. And how, where, where do you end up mentally there? You end up, they end up trapped. And then you combine that with the fact that they're young, in rugby sense, males, proud people, they don't want to talk about it, they don't want to show any emotions, and it can become a downward spiral. Um, and I think that's a big part of it. I think people's got to people got to realise that no sport chooses you a lot of the time. You don't necessarily choose sport, so people have to have a bit of respect for the fact that actually a lot of these guys are doing a job that they might not actually enjoy. Just like Joe Bloggs is doing a job they might not enjoy as a lawyer or an accountant. So have respect for that fact that they are putting their body on the line for 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 you know a modest amount of money, considering what they do day in, day out. And that just sums up why the RPA actually exists and how Restart Rugby has kind of been generated and why I, I feel very lucky to have partnered with Restart for the podcast as well. I think the work that they do is really important with especially the mental health uh, aspect of it because not enough is being done in certain aspects uh, elsewhere, especially in a lot of other workplaces. It's not just rugby. Just because Restart Rugby has been you know, created for the rugby players doesn't mean it shouldn't exist in other yeah, of workplaces. Course. Of course, and also for the... For the, for the coaches and the physios and the support staff, you know, they, they're under just as much, if not more stress than the players half the time, but there's nothing there for them. And that's why restart's so important. But the difficulty, the difficult thing is the size of this beast, you know, that is the mental health space. And actually, a lot of the time, the people that need help, you would have no idea they need help. The people that come forward and ask for counselling, 
you know that's fine you know they they they're being proactive and they're doing it for themselves so they don't need as much help you you give them the help that's where restarts there to support the difficulty is finding and getting the people that don't want to talk about it who are really in dark holes finding them and helping them out proactively and that takes a huge amount of resources and a huge amount of money that just doesn't exist at the moment for restart but i think this is going to keep moving forward and keep growing there's gonna be more attention behind it i've seen the amazing work they do and how important they are but there's still a huge way to go huge way to go well i'm really excited to be getting involved for sure but you're no stranger to a podcast and as you already mentioned you have you now work for channel four doing some punditry if i'm correct yeah reporting yeah. <laughs> reporting the questions grilling um, people, but yeah. how have you found that aspect of your life transitioning from player to you know on the other side of the camera almost you know um you have the to, dark side you, yeah, yeah that's that's what will green recorded <laughs> didn't he um but did you always think that you wanted to stay involved in rugby, regardless of the injury or not? Did you always think that rugby was going to control some other aspect of your life after retirement? To be honest, no, not at all. I thought that um, people always asked if I was interested in going into coaching. You know, I'd got to 28, 29 and I was starting to think about, you know, I'd, I'd done a degree and a master's. I was starting to think about, you know, life after sport, uh, life after rugby. I mean, you have to, you know, you, you never know when an injury is going to come. Plus the average age, you know, if you make it into your mid thirties, you've done very well. Um, mm. And I thought I wanted a clean break. I wanted a new challenge. I was going to go and work in the city. I'd done a sort of finance degree in, in commercial property. And that was the route I was going to go down. I probably would have been very happy doing that, but that wasn't the case. I got cut short. Um, and I was just very fortunate that, you know, I got offered this opportunity to stay within the game, but not have to be, I thought if I was going to stay in the game, it would be coaching, you know, actively day in, day out. But with the media side, I can be a fan, you know, and a former player. I get to go, I now get to watch rugby as a fan, you know, and it's not my job anymore as such. The media side seems to, you know, separate yourself from that a little bit more. I go to the games, I'm interviewing a lot of my old mates half the time. Which is very enjoyable. Yeah, it's really enjoyable. Sometimes And you're getting paid for it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, my first ever <laughs> first ever game I did was Bath to lose in the European Cup last year. And obviously I used to play at Bath. And uh, I had to do the interview straight after the game after Freddie Burns, who's a good mate of mine, got the ball knocked out of his hands. So they lost the game last play of the match. Mm. And obviously that makes it a bit more difficult because you've got to bring it up, but you don't want to throw your mate under the bus, but you realise that's part of the job. But that goes back to the fact that you have to have respect for, for players' emotions. I know he didn't do it on purpose. Some For some reason, fa some fans and press would like to frame it as though he did because it makes a bit more noise. Um, so there's certain scenarios, but I think it does help in a way sometimes that players and coaches might open up a little bit more because of the fact that I have played the game quite recently. Um, and also they know I'm not after an angle. I'm not there to try and screw anyone over or try and get them to slip up because I have too much respect for the players in, in that sense. So they do seem, I'm hoping, well, they seem to just relax a little bit more and open up a little bit more rather than if I was a straight media pundit who likes to throw people under the bus every now and again. Not saying they all do that, no. but some do. Yeah, for sure. So obviously you're enjoying that reporting aspect of it. And you've already mentioned the Alpine Pass and going to Nepal. But what is next for Ed Jackson? Do you want to explain a little bit more about those uh, other projects and your fundraising as well? Yeah, so um, I mean, now, I mean, the, the, my wife always reminds me that charity work doesn't pay the mortgage, which she's very <laughs> right about. But it all goes back to me finding that bit of value again in my life from writing the blogs. And I've kind of got addicted to, to that and, you know, helping other people to make me feel good as well. It's like a win-win. You know, it's kind of a new purpose. And in that respect, I was offered a chance to go to Nepal last October with a charity called Neverest Orthopaedics. And um, one of my mates who actually used to play for Northampton Saints, Charlie Davies, his dad works as an orthopaedic surgeon. Um, so I went over to Nepal. I, th I Actually, they asked me when I was in hospital. I thought, well, there's no way I'm actually going to be able to go there. But I just thought I could help from home raise some awareness because they what they want to do is build a spinal uh, a new spinal injury ward over there, eighty births and rehabilitation hospital. But when I started standing and walking, I thought, shit, here we go. I might actually get to go to Nepal, and I did. I went over with my wife last last October, and the idea was just to help raise a bit of awareness to help them do a bit of fundraising. But naturally, I got completed completely addicted by the whole place. I'd already got hooked on hobbling at dragging myself up mountains after Snowdon you know I'd gone and climbed Mont Bouet in the Alps and 
all of a sudden I was in the Himalayas staring at these 8,000 meter peaks, just dreaming about what could potentially be, be down the line. But, um, it was the people, um, and just the need for it over there. The fact that spinal cord injury rates are high. I thought it was people falling off mountain passes, but it's not. It's people falling out. It's a lot of it's in the lowlands. They do a lot of fruit farming and the kids fall out of the trees and it doesn't take a big drop to, to break your neck or your mm. back. Once you're in a wheelchair, then um, obviously it's not the flattest country in the world. No. There's not a lot of tarmac any, anywhere. It's very difficult. And despite being one of the most beautiful countries in the world, it's still one of the poorest. So um, there isn't really... Um, any resources for them they become another mouth to feed to their family there's no desk jobs for them to go into like there is in the UK or um you know over over here and and they end up a lot of them on the streets or and 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 consequently you know dying it's pretty pretty tough pretty ruthless and combine that with the fact they're buddhist which is my favorite religion they're the most accepting religion in the world but they believe in karma so they think that there's no sympathy for disability basically any disability because it, they think it's something you've done in your previous life. So these people are basically, un, they've got no support from the government, from anything. So Western charities have to get involved to help. Um, and they wanted 250 grand to build an 80-bed spinal rehabilitation hospital, which is about the salary of one of the chairmen at one of the hospitals in the UK. Yeah, for sure. Which is ridiculous, the amount of lives that could change over there. I mean, they can build a, ho- they can build a school for five grand. You know, I thought that's such a, a relatively small amount of money for the amount of lives it can change that I was sat on the plane and just thought, right, I've got to do this. I'm going to get home. I'm going to ring my mates who have recently retired, going through a transition themselves, because that's important to me as well. Give them a purpose give them something to aim for, do something altruistic, you know, something that's really selfless because I know how much that can help you, them them mentally as well and try and raise this money. So we got together, sat down, me and Ollie Barkley, one of the ex-Bath England players, we're kind of leading the whole thing and um, we came up with a a series of fundraisers to try and raise this money. We started off by running a couple of rugby events. Then we came up with a concept called Beat, which is um, music and food, so pairing chefs and DJs because we said to each other, if we're going to raise this money, we want to do it in a bit of a different way or some way that we find fun because we're fed up of, you know. How many fundraisers have you been to and sat down at? Black tie, heads and tails, auction, blah, blah, blah. It's good if you've got a good table of people. If not, you wouldn't be there unless it was for charity. Mm. These events, we want people to want to be there anyway. It just feels like having a great time. It just so happens it's all for charity. So we ran our first one of them. It was really successful. We've got our next one coming up in November. And the other thing is, obviously, I'm going to keep climbing and going as high as I can, but to get other people involved on those climbs because I realise the benefit, especially not just physically, but mentally the benefit of being in the mountains and achieving something and walking upwards as a group. So we went, we just got back from Grand Paradiso trying to climb the highest freestanding mountain in Italy. Unfortunately, the weather turned against us on the last day, but we still climbed over five and a half thousand meters over the, over the course of the four days. Amazing trip. And I'm off to Nepal in October to go back and try and climb Mira Peak, which is six and a half thousand meter, 21,000 foot, one of the highest trekking peaks in the world. Um, which is an 18 day attempt all in order to try and raise money for this spinal unit. Um, and because of that, we started something called M2M Presents, which is millimeter, stands for millimeters to mountains, which mm. is kind of my journey from the first time I flicked my toe to now being in the mountains, but also symbolizes anyone's journey. Going through a struggle or something tough, start small, but dream big and you know keep moving forward step by step. So um, we want to carry this on. Once we've raised the money for the spinal unit, which hopefully we will do, we're still looking. We've raised about 50 grand so far from the individual fundraising efforts. We're still hoping that someone will come will, will come forward and, and help or take a big chunk out of that. If we have, we have actually been offered naming rights on the spinal unit. So if someone was going to come and make up the extra 200 grand, for example, then it could be called the HSBC spinal unit. You know, anything. Nudge, like, nudge. Nudge, nudge. Anything like that. Um, um, which is amazing legacy considering how many totally. people it could It'd help. So, so we're hoping we can still get that done by the end of next year. Obviously, we, we need some, it'd be great to get some, some, some corporate sponsorship or maybe an individual who wants to come and help us out. But um, we're going to keep climbing, going to keep going higher and higher. I've said publicly now in The Guardian that I want to be the first quadriplegic on top of Everest. I'm yeah. going to stand by that. Um, and, you know, how far this journey goes, I'm not sure. But 
it's I'm going to keep moving forward, keep setting those goals, keep trying to change perceptions about spinal cord injury and try and help as many people as possible along the way. I think all the work you're doing is awesome. So like best of luck with everything that you do and hopefully I can support you in any way that possibly that I can as well in whatever your quest might be if I have the time well, to go to, drag to the you up a mountain, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't um, so say the, that because I will tie you into that. Oh god, here we go. Here we go. I'm going to be added to the WhatsApp group. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is a rugby World Cup special uh, podcast of Headstrong. So I have to ask you the question: Who is going to make the Rugby World Cup final on the second of November? Genuinely, who do you think? Despite being patriotic, England and South Africa. Yeah, yeah. There you go. You heard it here first. And so I have two final questions that I ask every single guest on Headstrong. And the first one is, which I think you've perhaps might have answered, but it'll be interesting to see what you say. What piece of advice would you give your younger self when you were eighteen? And alter- or, or alternatively, what piece of advice um, should you give young adults now uh, that you think they should live by? Do things that make you nervous. And I don't mean jumping in front of a bus because that's probably quite nerve-wracking I mean I feel like I probably lived in my bubble a little bit um people don't like uncertainty or change it's scary it's human nature not to do that now since I've since my accident and things been put in perspective I've just started saying yes to everything talking in front of people like hundreds of people would have terrified me before and it still did it did and it still does but I just said life's too short I'm going to say yes to everything and by saying yes to everything all of a sudden I'm potentially climbing mountains and running parties for a living I'm speaking to people on podcasts like this I'm on tv in front you know on channel four just from saying yes and giving things a go people don't have the confidence or give themselves enough credit for what they're actually capable of and uh, yeah, fortune favours the brave. So I think your body, te- that nervous feeling is actually your body telling you there's room for growth. And if you do those things that make you nervous, you can actually push those boundaries out a little bit more and you grow a little bit more. And all of a sudden, those things that used to make you nervous, you're comfortable with. So uh, I think that's probably what I tell myself. My mum wouldn't say the same thing, though. I would have, I would have thought. <laughs> <laughs> so my final question is, what does the word headstrong mean to you? I mean... The word resilience keeps popping up, I think. Um, like you've, I, you've touched on it before. I mean, it's a difficult one. Your body is nothing, really. And I thought it was everything to me. But you are whatever's in your head. I was on a neuro ward, so there was people on there with brain injuries. And to see people's families going in to see someone who could walk around, but they were a different person because of their injury, I felt very lucky. And that was a bit of perspective change for me. You know, I was still Ed. I couldn't move, but I was still the same person. And realising that actually you're in complete control and you are defined by what is in your head, not your body, not your circumstance, not how much money you've got. And you're in complete control of that and your reactions. You can't affect what happens to you a lot of the time, but you can always affect how you react to that. So just being able to put things into content, context, I feel like it's a bit of a gift. I've had a crash course in that. Um, <laughs> it's a bit more difficult when people haven't been through a trauma to, to persuade them to, to, be able, to be able to explain or for, that, for it to really sink in. But um, I suppose that that's headstrong for me. It's resilience and realising that actually it's not the end of the world because I used to think that getting cut up in the car in the morning and having road rage, it was the end of the world and it ruined my day. But just getting things in context and... Um, being able to move forward through anything and learning and, and realising that actually when bad stuff does happen to you, because it will happen throughout people's lives, you know, even if nothing bad's ever happened to you, eventually your parents are going to die, you know, realising that's an opportunity for growth and they're the things that mould you and define you. So staying strong in your head around that scenario, keep moving forward, learning from things and soaking them up rather than burying your head in the sand and trying to ignore stuff because that that doesn't help anyone. So... I suppose that's what it means to me. Ed, thank you so much for welcoming me into your house. I've really enjoyed the conversation. I you think you said some incredibly inspiring things, so hopefully everybody will draw from your, your inspiring words and hopefully you'll be able to raise your funds for Nepal and also continue raising money for Restart Rugby. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, long may it continue. So thanks so much. Thanks for coming. No worries. Well, that is it for episode one of this second series of Headstrong. I want to say a huge, huge thank you to Ed Jackson for giving up his time to chat to me, but also for being such an inspiring individual and devoting his life to helping others. I just want to take this moment to wish Ed the best of luck in all of his future endeavours. 
Thank you so much for tuning in to listen to this first episode of Headstrong. If you liked it, please rate it, subscribe, tell all your friends and family and anyone else who you think might be struggling or might enjoy this great chat with Ed. I'm now going to hand over to Damien Hopley, the group CEO of the Rugby Players Association, to tell you a little bit more about the official charity of the RPA and my partner, Restart Rugby. My name is Damien Hopley, Group Chief Executive of the Rugby Players Association. Restart is the official charity of the RPA, and the charity provides crucial support to current and former professional rugby players suffering from serious injury, illness or hardship. Since 2005, Restart has invested over £1.7 million into player welfare and support by funding medical treatment, rehabilitation or disability support, financial support and emotional support by providing a 24-7 confidential counselling service and we're the only body in English rugby that invests in mental health support. One in four people in the UK will be affected by mental illness in any year. Rugby players are no exception and often the pressures and strains that act as a catalyst to mental health issues are magnified for professional athletes. Players often find it difficult to cope with the transition out of rugby and the reality is that over 60% of players reported mental health issues post-retirement and over 50% of players take two years or longer to be in control of their lives post-rugby. In 2008, the Rugby Players Association and Restart launched a 24-7 telephone helpline and counselling service to provide vital mental health support to those players and families that were facing struggles. 42 current and former players accessed the confidential counselling last year. More than 140 players have accessed the counselling service over the past three seasons. Every year, Restart spends up to £60,000 on our confidential counselling service to help support our players. Without support from donors and fundraisers, Restart would simply not be able to continue this vital support for our players. Sadly, these mental health issues can lead to devastating consequences. Suicide is the biggest killer of men under 45 in the UK, and rugby players are not immune. It's great to see the players talking more openly about their mental health struggles within rugby and after they finish playing. Thank you for all your support towards Restart. Without people like yourselves, we could not help players and their families in the way that we do. So thank you all very much.